our live stream and chat. We're talking today with the wonderful, the very talented Stephanie Bauer, who is um, a, an architectural illustrator, an urban sketcher, uh, an urban sketching um, instructor, and she's a watercolor uh, painter, an expert, and an author. And today she's going to be doing a demo, and so it's really exciting. And let's just bring Stephanie into the call. I think that's good. Yay! Hi, everybody. Oh Welcome. my God. <laughs> I had, I just, I was scrolling through some of the names and I have to give a couple of shout outs. So I see Eileen right off the top from San Francisco. I uh, see Hello. Bill Hook, my friend here in Seattle, who's a fantastic watercolor painter. If you don't follow him, you should. Um, gosh, I saw Pierre Brody. He, he commented yesterday that uh, he wasn't able to uh, get Zoom going. It looks like he did. I'm so glad, yeah. Pierre. Welcome from Paris. Um, I saw Rui, <laughs> Rui Ting Lim from uh, Australia, where it must be two in the morning, I think, Rui, right? Yeah. So he's mm -hmm. such a dear. So thanks everybody for, for joining in on this. Um, it's really a treat to get to do this, uh, especially when there are so many challenging things happening in the world lately. Um, you know, to be able to talk about sketching and uh, it's something that brings us comfort and joy and that's a very good thing uh, mm -hmm. right about now. Yeah, so, super. Thanks for this opportunity, Brenda. Yeah, well, thank you, Stephanie. Again, second time is a charm. <laughs> Hopefully all of our recording technology works for us this time. Mm -hmm. um, so you're going to be sharing some of your sketches and just talking about um, your work and uh, giving us lots of encouragement and inspiring yeah, you know, us. I find that, uh, you know, being stuck at home for over three months now, I, I tend to look back on um, uh, things that got me to this point. And so I started really looking at old sketches and sketches I did a really long time ago. <laughs> and um, so uh, I thought it'd be useful to talk a little bit about the journey and some of the aha moments I had along the way, because I did, you know, I feel like there were occasionally there were these big quantum leaps in development. Um, you know, you work, you work, you work, you work, and then suddenly, boom, something, something breaks through and, uh, and suddenly you're quite a bit better. And then you keep working, 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 and then boom, something, uh, another breakthrough happens. So I just wanted to show some of the breakthroughs that I had and, and talk about them. Oh, that's really exciting. So uh, Stephanie, should we go to uh, your sketches now? Yeah. All right. Let's go there. Okay. Well, these are my mini moo cards. These are actually my business cards. And uh, it's kind of a, a good way to show a sampling of, um, of some of the places that I've been and places I've been able to sketch. And uh, I just feel so privileged. I really am you know, privileged and honored to get to teach and, and travel to all these amazing places. So when I get a little depressed, I pull out my mini moo cards. <laughs> You play cards. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and look at these, and um, and it makes me happy. So well, that's nice. And these are the little mini moo cards that they're like half size uh, landscape orientation yes. business cards from Moo that people order often. You see the urban sketches at the symposium carrying them around. Yes, that's true. That's yeah. exactly what they are. And this works so, really well if you if you have landscape orientation sketches, which you do a lot. I do. Yeah, that's most of what I do. I love landscape proportions. So, cool. um, so those are my little cards. And uh, but if we go back, back to the beginning um, with the next next image, this was from uh, um, the, this is a series of three images actually. But this is the first one uh, from when I was in architecture school. Wow, Brenda, that black box came up again. Yeah, right. I'm sorry. Um, I'm rid of it. So um, I took a fantastic drawing class my third year of architecture school. A lot of people uh, just took that class for no credit because it was such a good class. Um, and um, it was taught by a man named George Fialva. <laughs> I see the, the grace coming and going. So what are you going to do going now? On. They're really, uh, 
popping in and out all over the place. I don't know what other people see, but um, yeah, I'm Stephanie. What I'm going to do is just lock the meeting so we won't have any more people joining. Okay. Okay, and that will help. And so yeah, sorry well, everybody. Thanks for your patience. Yeah, so that's 89 people in this meeting, and that's enough. That's probably my controls. All right, there we go. Go ahead, Stephanie. All right, now that bar should disappear. Um, so um. So back to architecture school, you know, before we entered our fourth year of architecture school, we had a portfolio review and three professors had to review each person's portfolio. So here am I about to be a senior, my fourth year, and I've already invested three years in architecture, the architecture program at UT Austin. And of the three professors, two of them wrote weak graphic skills. Oh. So I, I was, Stunned. I mean, and it, but they were absolutely right. Um, so anyway, I, I was shocked. I almost changed out of architecture and thought I, maybe I should do something else. But instead, I thought, well, this is a good challenge. Yeah. You know, I'm not going to let this get me down. I'm not going to let this defeat me. So um, I took um, this class from George Vialva. It was the last semester he ever taught at the University of Texas, and it was a fantastic fantastic class and it's really the foundation for my own sketching and the way I teach sketching. I've expanded on it over the years after through my own experience of teaching, but George was uh, was really pivotal and, and life changing for me. So I really struggled in that class and uh, but I was determined and I just kept working at it and working at it and working at it. And this was the final, you know, the final exam we had to do a project. And um, so I sat on Congress Avenue in, in Austin and, and did this line drawing. And it shows how he taught people how to sketch. So first, the small one in the upper left-hand corner is a postcard size right. image. We work on cheap paper. It was cheap newsprint in pen so that you commit to the sketch yeah. um, and don't spend half your time erasing what you draw. Yeah. Um, and so just the essence was in the first uh, 60 to 90 seconds. Sometimes he made us do a five second sketch. I mean, it was unreal, but it taught us to really see the essence of the space and, and figure out what the essentials are to capture in, in a drawing. And you know, after 90 seconds or eight minutes, you really have a complete sketch. Right. Um, as opposed to having a beautifully rendered portion of a sketch. Right. So, um, so, and he also advocated for first learning line, then learning tone, and then learning color. The reason being that each time you go from line to tone and then tone to color, the level of complexity is, is enormous. So, um, so first comes line, then comes tone, and then color is just so much more complicated. Um, so anyway, there's my eight minute line drawing, and the next one should be my, um, my marker sketch. So then we did tone. Um, you can see I was better at line. <laughs> but, uh, that's the tone drawing, so dark street, um, and then the Texas State Capitol in the, in the distance. Um, and then the next one is color. So at this point, can you go, go to the next one? Yeah, thanks. Um, was color and I think I was really tired. It got, it got pretty muddy back there, but uh, that was the progression. I have to say the 98 that you see in the corner is the highest grade he ever gave. So, wow. Um, I just was floating after this. It was such a, a motivator and, um, uh, gosh, it just, it got me sketching and um, gave me confidence. And from then on something, that day something clicked and mm -hmm. my hand-eye coordination really kicked in. And from then on, I could kind of, um, you know, draw more or less what was in my head. You know, it's a little like riding a bike. You, you try, you try, you fall, you fall. And then all of a sudden something in your brain clicks and your balance is good and you can ride a bike. Yeah. And you don't unlearn riding a bike. You might get a little rusty, but um, same thing for sketching. It's, it's a, um, you know, the click that I talk about is sort of like a coordination happening between your brain and your eye and your hand. And that was a, a, a major click day for me <laughs> a really long time ago. So 
that's that holds a lot of sentimental value for me and it's i'm so glad i still have those sketches cool very cool and you know you're probably looks at like you're not even working with the best set of markers <laughs> yeah well it's a long time ago yeah I, I go from weak graphic skills to teaching drawing as a profession drawing as a as a profession and uh and writing two books on drawing <laughs> yeah well that's fantastic that's very encouraging for people i think yeah that's that's exactly the intent so um not long after architecture school i had the opportunity to work in oxford england and i had a the sketchbook and i um i attempted to do some sketches while i was there and i kind of I, I was pretty rusty you know every time i i do a trip i have to slog through maybe a week to 10 days of sketches i really typically don't like and it's again trying to get warmed up in that and hand eye coordination back. Right. So um, this was uh, in Oxford, England, and where I was working. And um, this is Radcliffe Camera, which I, I show this kind of rough sketch uh, because I'm going to show you the same or similar view again that I did a little, uh, well, many decades later, actually. <laughs> But you can see it's it's a little, it's heavy handed. I tend to have a heavy hand, so um, I had to learn how to work with that, and that's part of why I use a mechanical pencil now because I do have such a heavy hand. Right. Um, so there's Radcliffe camera. So then I figured out um, that if I um, switched to a smaller sketchbook, it might be easier to control. So that's in fact what I did. The that's the first sketch the radcliffe camera was in the, like an eight by ten sketchbook and i just couldn't control it very well so i thought well maybe if i work smaller so then i switched to a sketchbook that was um maybe five by seven at mm -hmm. the most and and again something clicked and um suddenly uh, because i wasn't having to deal with the detail i could just um just kind of um it was, it was easier to control the sketch and I had more success that way. So that's why I always encourage people when they're starting out to sketch, to sketch small. And I love that about Gabby Campanario because he, he has this sketchbook he literally puts in his pocket and carries nothing yeah. but a big pen right. and does masterful sketches. So small is faster, small is easier to control. So work small at first. And less intimidating as well, I think, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That big blank piece of paper is intense. Yeah. So uh, uh, Bix is saying that it amazes her how you can work so small and get so much detail in there. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, little dots, you know, are suggestive of detail. And uh, I, there's really not too much detail in the real drawing, but it kind of suggests it. And then the brain, your brain contributes to, to seeing that detail. Right. And then this is uh, I'm just gonna... so same for this one. This is a couple years later, it says 2018, but it wasn't 2018. I'm not sure why it says that. <laughs> but um, and this was, I think, the following year. And you can see the difference going from that Oxford sketch to to this. And then this is also in a bigger sketchbook. So once I kind of got comfortable with the small sketchbook, moving to the larger sketchbook was an easier jump to make. So. Um, and then I found there was more information that I wanted to be able to get in. So I, some of that detail that Bixie was talking about, uh, I was able to get into the larger sketchbook, but it was a progression. I had to work up to it. So small sketchbook, not a whole lot of detail, uh, then eventually larger sketchbook where I could capture more of that detail. Right. So and hopefully we'll go here to sketch next year, Brenda. <laughs> so where is this one? This is in Seville. Oh, really? I'm looking yeah. forward to it. What, are, what is the subject? Uh, oh, gosh, I knew you were going to ask me that. And I'm, just, <laughs> I'm drawing a blank on, on Plaza de España, I think it is. Oh, really? They filmed Lawrence of Arabia. Yeah, <laughs> right. So, yeah, the architecture in Sevilla is fantastic. I really hope we're able to travel by, by May next year. Yes, and we'll talk about this a little bit more at the end, but Stephanie and I have a, a gorgeous um, travel workshop planned uh, in Seville for next May, 1 to 5, and um, we're just hoping that the coronavirus uh, cooperates with our plan, but, so we'll see. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, okay, next one. 
So this, um, this is from a camping trip. I, I had a decades where I really didn't do much sketching at all. And uh, I saw the Marilyn Deering. Hi, Marilyn is, is on this, this call, the Zoom call. And um, she was on this camping trip. And my friend Mark Smedley, another architect who draws beautifully, uh, said, come on, we're going to go sketch. And I had no, no equipment with me. He hands me a piece of paper, an old paintbrush that, you know, is the kind your, your kid would use in school, and, um, and some watercolors. And so I sat and did this, this view. We both, you both sketched. And this sketch wasn't a breakthrough so much as it got me sketching again. It realized how much I really enjoyed it. And, um, and so I, uh, I just, I kind of picked up, picked up sketching again uh, with, with the sketch. So thank you to Mark Smedley, my good friend. <laughs> and hardly any line work in here, just, very, yeah, that's true. Yeah. That's true. Wow, beautiful, yeah, beautiful. It's part of the evolution. Yeah, and oh my gosh, so gorgeous, Stephanie. So here's another one. It's 2002, another camping trip. I literally had like five-year-olds climbing all over me as I'm attempting to do this. And um, this is very near Seattle at Rosario Beach. And I was uh, determined to to try and uh, do painting again when I could. So um, this is a, a small little sketch on cheap paper and, but it captured the, that backlit scene at Rosario Beach. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember the kids climbing all over me as I'm attempting to do this. So <laughs> it's kind of amazing what comes back. Yeah, well, it, it's true when you're sketching and all, you remember everything. Um, so people, if you want to ask Stephanie a question, you can send me, Brenda Murray, a Facebook message and I will read it out. All right. Wow. So then we jump to, um, to India, a country that I love. And um, my parents lived there before I was born. And so for me, it was a little like the salmon returning home when I, when I go to India. I'd always wanted to go. And I had the opportunity um, in 2011 to go uh, with my friend Nancy for on a, and, and I was determined to go and sketch. So, you know, I, I realized with kids and work and um, just so much going on in life, all the volunteer stuff, I, I really didn't have time to, to develop or pursue my own sketching. So I hear a train. <laughs> so uh, I'm sorry. Um, I couldn't have predicted that, but we do yeah. have a train that passes by every a couple it's of like times every there. day. It's like we're there. Let, so, let's let's just start again with India. And I, I can cut yeah, this out of the so video. I had someday it'll be a TED talk because it's kind of an interesting story how I got to India, but um so the, and this sketch was a real breakthrough for, through, for me. This was in a, a big Moleskine sketchbook. It's, the sketch is enormous. It's probably 20, no, 24 inches wide or something really huge. Wow. And we found a spot to sit where most people wouldn't, wouldn't um, bug us too much. Uh, it was up high. And, and I thought I would do this sketch. And I remember trying to make these long horizontal lines go across my page and I just couldn't control it. So then I remembered, oh, I have a straight edge. So I pulled out this little triangle I had with me and suddenly was able to snap these really long horizontal lines with, with accuracy and, um, and without having to mess with it and, and uh, erase it and do it again. And um, so this is the first sketch that I did that used a straight edge. Wow. Um, and, um, and I only had two colors. It's a, a raw sienna and a cerulean. Um, so I used the colors to kind of create a focal point at that building um, towards the back in the center. And um, so, so this was a, a breakthrough for me. It, it was enormous. It, it captured the whole scene. Uh, I write no notes on the side so that I don't, uh, because I have a tendency to forget some of the details. And, um, and then when I got home, I, I found out about this international um, competition called the K-Rob. And I submitted this sketch and it won for a wow. best trial sketch. 
And that launched a whole, whole other range of things. It's basically starting in 2011 was like this giant wave that was, that was starting. I could see it off in the distance and I knew it was going to be a really good wave for, for writing. So I'm still on that wave. Good for you. That's really, I'm so, I'm so happy for you, Stephanie. It's wonderful. Thank you so much, Brenda. Yeah. And uh, Bix says that that tool, meaning I, the, uh, the triangle tool, was a game changer for me, she says. Oh, that's great. So glad to hear that. Thanks for that, Bixie. Yeah. All right. That, this is a beautiful sketch, Stephanie. I love how you've kept all the solid buildings. Anything that's solid is, is just in the white and then the sky and the water with color. It's gorgeous. Yeah. Thanks. I mean, I, you know, most of the drawings I do are one point perspectives. I can really milk a one point perspective, you know, <laughs> so get the most out of this one point. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. <laughs> And then uh, in 2013, I, I was awarded a fellowship to go study in France. So um, this was at the very beginning of that trip. And I, it's funny because I used to lie awake at night on that trip and think, uh, gosh, am I a pen person or a pencil person? I mean, literally lie awake at night. And so it was a big revelation to me that I finally figured out I'm a pencil person. Really? Um, and this was one of these sketches that, that allowed me to do that, I'm sitting at the sun in the Tuileries and, um, and did this sketch. And, you know, never in a, in a million years would I have imagined it would be on the cover of a book. So um, anyway, it's, again, a whole lot of sentimental value to me. It's a one point perspective. Uh, this was where I first really started doing these light buildings and darker skies and blackened in the little windows and and mm -hmm. started using a mechanical pencil my first mechanical pencil i bought at saint Elier in paris That's and uh, really cool. and i i i keep buying that same brand because i'm afraid to switch to anything else it's your lucky pencil brought me so much luck yeah and so, so um do you ever erase like do you have an eraser in your sketch uh, pack I do. I use it infrequently. Um, I only use it at the beginning when I'm setting up the the basic line work, you know, those big shapes that I talk about um, in my classes. And if, if I need to move over the shape or lower the shape, um, then I'll erase it. But uh, for the most part, then I, I put it away and I just draw through everything. Actually, you really don't even need to erase much at all. Right. Um, and so, um, you, I see that you've left all the guidelines in here, and so it doesn't mm -hmm. look like you did much erasing at all, no. no. Um, which, which book was this on the, this sketch on the front cover of? This is Understanding Perspective, oh. my first book from 2016. Right, so cool. And you know, part of why I put it on the cover is because everybody loves Paris. <laughs> well, yeah, so. of course. <laughs> yeah. Um, so a uh, question from uh, Sandy. She says, why pencil versus pen? What's your thinking there? You know, I get a whole lot more variety of line with, with pencil. I can do very, very light, barely visible lines. I can do really dark lines. Um, I can vary the line super easily as I'm drawing the line. I can, you know, bear down, make it darker, make it lighter, make it thicker, make it thinner. And um, so I feel like I have more control. Um, and then for me, my pen drawings, I find end up looking kind of cartoony and flat. So um, there are times when I, I like pen, but in general, I don't use it very much because I, I just like the variety. And I think you know, with the pen, I always feel like the watercolor is sort of like a coloring book. I'm just filling in a lot of the the shapes whereas uh with this if my goal is to get kind of a happy balance between the pencil line and the watercolor so that neither one obscures the other my gosh that's an interesting way of explaining it very helpful yeah. you know it, it's so interesting how how there the urban sketches out there who swear by their booty sailor bent nib pens yeah fountain pens and other people who just splash the color on and and you know, would never touch a pencil. And um, you know, they're all gorgeous. Um, yeah. But I have a deep appreciation for this pencil work as well. It's just really beautiful. Yeah, so, I mean, I really admire the the people who are working in pen, and it's something I, I aspire to, and I I try sometimes. I keep 
thinking I'm going to do it, but in the end, I, I just, I love the pencil. I love the tactile quality of the pencil on paper. I, I just, I, I don't know. I love pencil. I'm a pencil yeah. person. Yeah. I have a question here for you from Paula. She mm -hmm. says, uh, do you ever use water soluble graphite? I don't, I, I have it, but, um, uh, <laughs> I've yet to actually use it. It's another thing on my list of things to try. Um, you know, I think for me, the issue would be how it works with watercolor. I, I think you have to kind of make a decision probably between one or the other. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't, and, and then the gra water soluble graphite would taint all the paints in my palette. So I'd have to have a, and it's something I want to try. I literally pull it out. I carry it with me because I'm like, oh yeah, the perfect moment for that water soluble pencil is going to come up any moment now. So, yeah. um, but no, I have yet to try it, but I, I really want to. Yeah. Um, so Vic says that she agrees with you that the pencil work makes your, your work really stand out. Ah, oh, thank you. That's so nice. I love all these messages. Thank you. Um, so part of my project uh, with the Gabrielle Prize um, for that fellowship in 2013 was to study the use of perspective in in the gardens at both Versailles and um, another Chateau Vaux le Vicomte, which ended up, ended up being my main project was was there. And let me apologize to anybody from France who's listening to my my bad French. <laughs> I really apologize. Um, but this was a real uh, ground, like eye-opening sketch for me. You know, the premise of that fellowship, it's, it's awarded to one architect in the US each year. Wow. And I just, oh my God, I thank my lucky stars that I, I happened to get it in 2013. And the premise is to learn about architecture by sketching on location and by actually drawing it you're, when you're standing right in front of the building or the space. Wow. And, um, Boy, was that perfect for me. So um, that three months in, in France was a time when I had no distractions. I didn't have to worry about money. I could just uh, draw and develop my own drawing style um, and, um, and way of thinking with, with a pencil in my hand. And this sketch was, was really significant because... Um, uh, you know, there's an advisor with this fellowship and he kept saying, just, you have to start sketching because I was doing so much sort of book research. He said, no, 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 just go out and sketch, just draw. So I went out and I'm, you know, standing at the top of this incredible axis at, at Versailles and, and I'm pulling out my pencil to measure the angles and I'm trying to figure out where the vanishing point. And I look and I realized where I'm standing, I don't know if you can tell from the sketch, but the vanishing point is literally at the head of the statue in the water at the distance. Yeah. And, and that statue is of Apollo, who's the sun, sun god, and he was the symbol for Louis XIV, um, who called himself the Sun King. And so I realized that Lenotre, who designed these gardens, had manipulated the landscape to literally um, you know, kind of force our perspective to yeah. that statue in the distance of, of um, his head. And Lenotre really understood perspective and worked all kinds of things into his designs that manipulated uh, the perspective to, to kind of choreograph the experience through the gardens. Yeah. So for me, this was like one aha moment after the other. I mean, it was just incredible. Yeah. And um, so this is a really important sketch to me and my evolution. I, wow. I love being there. And uh, a great revelation for the queen of the one point perspective too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, that's so funny. Um, so Leslie is asking uh, how you keep your pencil lines from smearing inside your sketchbooks. They do smear, but I've learned not to move my hand across the paper too much. So I, uh, and I'm right-handed, so I block out the shapes really lightly in pencil, uh, so they're barely visible. A lot of those I end up smearing away by the end of the sketch, but, um, and then I work from left to right. So once the, that line work is in, I um, start on the left-hand side of the sketch and then work, work my, way, my way across to the right. Mm -hmm. And that minimizes the amount of smearing on the paper. And do you but ever it use a... Do you ever use a piece of paper to block, like to, to kind of cover up the right? No, it's just too much of a hassle. No, I don't. 
cool. So uh, Doug is asking if you use a limited palette. You know, not intentionally, but yes, I, I do have a pretty limited palette. I use uh, French ultramarine. Um, I, French, my, my four core colors are French ultramarine, Windsor Newton French ultramarine, um, Windsor Newton burnt sienna, yellow ochre, and um, permanent alizarin crimson. And I can do pretty much any sketch with those four colors. Wow. Here, I also had some sap green but I doctor it, I, I knock it back with the burnt sienna um, to make it less intense and bright. And then I also use some new gamboge to brighten up the green um, so that uh, you can see that plane in the, in, right in front of us. I start with the, some new gamboge and then I start to drop some of that um, altered um, sap green. And then at the background, I'm dropping in blues. Like, Stephanie, um, could you uh, repeat that last color, which I've never heard of that color before? But New gamboge? Yeah. Oh, uh, it's a warm yellow. Okay. Can you spell it? <laughs> uh, well, new. Like okay. New. And then G A M B is a boy. O G E. New gamboge. I'm going to look that up. Is that a Windsor Newton? Really similar to a Hansa yellow medium, something like that. Oh, okay. Is that I a Windsor Newton I color? Stumbled upon it. I, I'm not always totally happy with new gamboge. I'm still on the lookout for the perfect yellow. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think I have another question for you. Um, so um, Leslie's asking, after the sketch is done, do you preserve them somehow? Um, she says hers blur afterwards through the sketchbook pages rubbing against one another. Um, I do not. Um, if there's something I really want to preserve, I put a light wash over it. So you can see where it says at the uh, view of green carpet toward Grand Canal at, at the bottom where I signed it. Yep. There's a very faint wash of kind of a grayed out yellow ochre. Yep. And once I paint that, it's, it's basically like dirty water. Once I paint that dirty water over my pencil work, it fixes the line and I literally can't erase it out. No. That's right. That's a trick. If, if you put watercolor mm -hmm. over pencil, you can't erase it after that. Yeah, it gets a little darker and um, also um, it, it fixes it to the paper. So if there's line work I really want to preserve, I will put a light, light wash of kind of a gray yellow ochre. Yeah. Wow, this is a gorgeous sketch. I, I love I've it. Heard, thank you. I've heard that the yellows somehow um, are better for fixing the pencil work. I don't know why, maybe it's the sediment in, in the yellow ochre. A couple more questions. Uh, Betsy says, Stephanie, your Versailles uh, sketch in particular has a very Beaux-Arts style uh, illustration feel to it. Did you study those types of illustrations? I did. I, 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 I didn't learn how to do them, but I certainly admired them and looked at them in architecture school. Yeah, for sure. I mean, they inspired generations of architects. Mm -hmm. Cool. And um, and uh, Doug says he needs to order your book on sketching tips, and we, we will talk about your book <laughs> a little bit later. So yeah, please order the book. <laughs> um, all right, let's see what else we have here. Oh wow, now we're going the other direction. Yeah. So um, it, I was. This is that same time in Paris. It was. I was walking someplace else started to rain so i just turned and went in the open door at notre dame mm -hmm. and sat while there was a service going on and and did this sketch and um boy am i glad i did yeah um yeah, yeah i mean uh, you know I, this this was this sketch was important for a lot of reasons um but I think as I look back on it now, you know, after the, that horrible, tragic fire, I mean, we were yeah. so many people around the world were upset, so upset by this. And yeah. um, I realized I too was extremely upset. And I, I realized that the things that we sketch really become um, part of our DNA it yeah. was the phrase that I used at the, when the, the fire happened. Um, and it's because, you know, looking so carefully, you really absorb the information in front of you. You know, some people sketch to um, make beautiful art, um, and that's a fantastic thing to do, but that's not my purpose for sketching. I, I sketch to really learn about 
what I see. So I, um, you know, I'm counting those, those bays and counting the columns and looking carefully at the windows and, and, um, you know, my, my sketch in the end might be a little, uh, not terribly precise, but, but I remember what I've looked at and drawn. Mm -hmm. So for me, sketching is a learning experience. I think your, your sketching style is more precise than a lot of uh, people's. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. And, and you've also captured that moment in time, right? Which is important because probably the ceiling will never look the same again, even after they repair it. Yeah. Well, we'll, we'll see what happens, but, um, but yeah, you know, this, this space is, and this sketch is um, near and dear to my heart. And, yeah. uh, and I think for many around the world. Yeah, yeah, it is. Then that same summer, I did my first trip to Civita di Bagnoreggio in, in Italy. And this was not long after my, um, I think it was after my Notre Dame sketch. Maybe not. <laughs> I think it was. And this is my first wide angle. Yeah. So, um, which became something of a signature and I love sketching church interiors for, you know, it's when it's super hot outside, yep. you can go in and uh, it's cool, it's quiet, there's often a place to sit and it's, uh, it's calming and you can kind of recharge and mm -hmm. I also really love the challenge, the perspective challenge of, of doing these drawings. So. Yes. This was my first wide angle. So you can see how the center portion of the perspective is, is normal, kind of straight up and down verticals. But as you get to the, to the edges of my cone of vision, um, I start gradually angling the, um, the columns, those vertical lines to a vanishing point that's way above. The three point uh, perspective, yeah. Yep, and, um, and that gives the, the feeling of being in the space, which is why, why I did it. it, just makes us feel like we're, you know, we're right there. Mm -hmm. Well, this is a really advanced, actually, Stephanie. It's not, this isn't really for beginners um, to be able to draw like this. It's, it's well, beautiful. you know, it's a sketch. So I've taught this, this would have been my eighth year to teach a workshop in, in Chivita. Mm -hmm. And it's typically been a five day workshop. This would have been a six day workshop. And by the fifth day, everybody's in the church doing this drawing. Cool. Cool. It's yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. So we work our way up to it. Yeah. <laughs> this is that same town. I had a fellowship there in 2014. Um, this is the first time I picked up this large um, pad. I happened to throw it in my suitcase at the last minute, and I ended up doing all the the drawings for my fellowship, um, the Chivita Institute fellowship um, study um, on this this big paper. So that was um, again, you know, working up to that larger size. This kind of started to work really well for me for some reason, and um, and what I in addition to, to the drawings and getting those in, for, for me, the triumph of this sketch was the variety of, of color um, yeah. on any surface. So, which is tricky, you know, this was a very hot, dry climate. So I had to work really quickly because um, the paint dries so fast, it doesn't have time to kind of move around on the paper. Uh, but to get the shade and the shadow and this, some variation in color, um, was a triumph for me. So I, I, I love this sketch. My favorite part is that little arch uh, under the stairs on the right hand side because I yeah. finally got that glow. Bill Hook, if you're still on this <laughs> Zoom call, I learned that from you. <laughs> okay, so what's the trick of that glow? Well, for, for me, so I, I mix a kind of a, a purpley gray with my French ultramarine and then I drop um, some Daniel Smith quinacridone burnt orange um, wow. in where I want that glow on the underside of that arch. And that, that color works like magic. It's very similar in hue to um, Daniel Smith, um, sorry, to Windsor Newton burnt sienna, right. but it behaves differently. So I have people get both. Wow. It, it, this is, you know, the thing I love about the sketch, two things. One is it looks like you've mixed the color on the paper not on your palette like there's no solid colors here right um and also all the bits of white that 
um, you obviously deliberately just um, didn't let your paintbrush touch. You just left these chinks of white and it's gorgeous. Yes, thank you so much for that. And I have to say, you know, the hardest part about painting is where you don't paint. Yeah. <laughs> so, but yeah, leaving bits of white for, for most of us, especially in a, in a sketch, um, is, is really important. Mm -hmm. Reserving that white of the paper mm -hmm. to add sparkle and a sense of light. And um, exactly, it's yeah. by far the hardest thing to do because you get caught up in the painting and you want to just cover everything. So you have to kind of plan ahead of time where yeah. you're going to that white. Yeah, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful sketch. Thank you. Then this is on another trip. Um, this is looking toward uh, the uh, cathedral in Orvieto. Um, I arrived in Orvieto, I was super jet lagged, and then I panicked because I realized I hadn't quite brought enough paper. I had this pentallic sketchbook. This is the, uh, what size is that? It's probably about eight by 10, maybe? I don't remember exactly. Um, and I thought, oh, I know what I'll do. I'll do several images on a page, and that way I won't run out of paper by the end of my trip. So I did um, all four images in, in one day with heavy jet lag. <laughs> so, Good for you. But I really liked it, and it became something I did in every city I now go to. When I have yeah. this sketchbook, I'll do a series of four street scenes. Right. Um, all some, not always in one day, but um, yeah, I'm jealous of your Orvieto trip because I wrote about Orvieto in my uh, master's thesis, but I've never been there. Oh, I hope you get to go. I it's a wonderful hill town, and it's not very far from Civita, so often the workshop groups will um get to Rome, then hightail it to Orvieto, and then um, all meet up there and then uh, travel by taxi together to Civita. Nice. nice. So this is Oxford. I had the opportunity to teach a workshop in Oxford in July of 2017. This is that same Radcliffe camera, but you know, decades later. So it's it's interesting to see how my hand has developed, how my drawing style has changed, and um, you know how I just. It's nice to see an evolution in one's work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I got to say. <laughs> right. So this is my evolution. This is in that same pentallic sketchbook. Um, and um, anyway, so if you could go to the, the next one, it kind of puts the two images side by side. Oh, wow. I did a, a USK talk that was also recorded, and, and you can watch it on their YouTube channel and also on their Instagram um tv mm -hmm. page but uh and then there was a challenge each each of the instructors who does a talk poses a challenge to other urban sketchers and mine was to go back and look at your look at your work from when you started sketching to oh, what cool. you're doing now so this is my then and now side by side and uh it's it's a big difference yeah you know, it's mm -hmm. more accurate it's um it's got color for one, and I pretty much taught myself watercolor. It's not something I learned in school. Right, yeah, very cool, beautiful. And it's just a comment from um, Paula who says, Stephanie, your handwriting is always so pretty, and did you learn it in architecture school? <laughs> that is a really good question. That's somebody who knows how architects, who knows how architects write. You know, we do kind of adopt a, a, a way of writing in, in architecture school. At least we did. I don't know if they still do because they're all on computer all the time. Um, so I would say it, it did influence my handwriting. Yeah. But, um, but it's still, still my, my handwriting. So, yeah. I remember yeah, looking at... All do. Oh. And the, the reason we all learn how to learn, used to learn how to do that architectural block lettering was so that because you had multiple people working on any one drawing. And the idea was to have similar handwriting so that there was consistency from when one person drew on the, the floor plans and then another person you know, changed something on the floor plans so that there, there was some consisti consistency in the lettering. Right, and that was the block lettering that you That's the architectural block lettering. But we also learned kind of a, a script handwriting as well that was more casual 
that was definitely has an architect's feel to it. Right, right. So um, a just question. Wanna, that's a good one. I want to ask you about the purple and I think it's burnt sienna that I'm seeing in here. Are, is it a question of doing a wash of the purple and then sort of charging in with that burnt sienna afterwards? That's yes, that's exactly right. Um, and this one, you know, is very much at the end of the day, and uh, those colors are actually pretty, pretty accurate. Um, it was there was this beautiful golden light on the white buildings in Dubrovnik. Um, this was last September, at the very end of September of 2019, and um, and then there are these deep dark shadows over. All, most of the ground. I mean, normally I try and leave some white of the paper on the ground, um, but I, I literally remember sitting there with my paintbrush charged with this very dark violet purple gray and thinking, do I want to do this? Do I, do I really want to go into this sketch with this really dark cover and color and cover up most of it? And I, and I literally said to myself, Stephanie, go big or go home. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I put that brush to paper and then just wash straight through from one, from the left to the right. And, um, and I ended up really liking it. Sorry, I, I skipped ahead too quickly by mistake. So I have a question for you from um, uh, Sandy. He says, at what stage did you put in the people? Was it after the wash? No, the people go in, uh, they're, you know, they're all in in the line drawing. So uh, I just painted right through all the people and then darkened a couple and left a little white on some of them. It's a I fantastic effect. Like these people. What? It's a fantastic effect just um, seeing the buildings through the people because people move all the time anyway. And so it's kind of like that if you're sitting. Yeah, there. that's a really good point. It does tend to feel like, um, like the, um, like the uh, people are moving. You know, for me, with my background as an architect, I, I like, I mean, I, I really love drawing buildings. Um, I, I really envy the people who can do just fantastic sketches of, of people, especially people in motion. Mm -hmm. um, but for me, I, I really just add people to give it a sense of activity and a sense of scale. They're not the focus or the purpose of the drawing. Yeah. They're, they're, telling us how big these buildings are and they're um, kind of animating the space. Yeah, cool, very cool. Yeah. Oh, yeah, we can go to this one. And then this one, this one I really liked. I sat right by a restaurant. The waiters kept coming over and looking over my shoulder and critiquing it <laughs> as, I was, as I was doing it. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, sat on my little stool amidst the crowds. And um, I like this one because uh, I I kind of finally, like in that Chivita sketch, I finally got the feel for the place. So I'm I want to make sure that in in my sketches I I want to change the colors I want, from one place to the next. I don't I don't want to I use I don't use the same um, same approach to colors in Mexico that I would in Dubrovnik, right? right? Uh, so, so um, you know, I don't want the style to overtake the information that I'm trying to capture. Ooh. So, um, and, and the buildings uh, are more or less white, kind of a creamy white, and, and the ground too. So it was hard to get that color and also get a sense for all this light that was bouncing all around, you know, all reflecting off of one surface and onto another. And so um, I was thrilled that I actually kind of got what I thought was a good quality of light um, mm -hmm. that captured that quality of light you know, mm -hmm. in the sketch. Now, now the waiter kept coming by and looking over my shoulder and he said, it looks like there's snow on the mountains. <laughs> oh, wow. I, I think you need, a, you need a taller stool, like a really tall <laughs> stool so that nobody can look over your shoulder. Yeah, <laughs> they, they would find a way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, I really wanted to leave some, some white up there because, uh, again, I, you talked earlier about reserving the whites, and uh, for me, I really wanted to leave some white. So, and there was white stone up there, so what the heck? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, cool. And so we're going to talk about your books, but why don't we wait to the end and go to your demo? Sure. Yeah, are we ready for that? I think we're really excited to 
see your demo. Are we ready to go? Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna talk a little bit about my approach to um, starting a sketch. Um, so some people would start with that doorway, and you know it's interesting because that is kind of the focal point of the sketch. It's dark. It's clearly the, the entrance to the building. It's what the architect wanted you to see. Mm -hmm. But it's hard to control the size and the proportions if you start with a piece of something. Mm -hmm. And another approach people might do is they want to start to work from left to right. Um, uh, for one, that's how we read. So that's kind of a natural way. But again, if you start with a piece, it's, it's much harder to work the proportions and um, and and well, basically to get the proportions right and get it located on your paper so it all fits and those lovely towers are not off the paper. Right. So instead, I use what I call um, big shapes. Um, so when I look at that scene, the first thing I notice is this big shape on the, on the building. This is in Den, Den Haag. Uh, I have family in Holland and um, this is the Ritter's Hall in the in the Binnenhof, the center of government for Holland. So that's kind of the big shape that I see, and it's almost a perfect square. So uh, squares are super easy to draw, and because the proportions are easy to get. So if you find a square, consider yourself lucky. But that's basically the first thing I I would look for is the, the big shape that kind of defines the sketch. Right. The next thing I'm doing is trying to locate the vanishing points. So I, in, in the real world, I'm doing this with a closing one eye and um, using my pencil to extend those lines that are vanishing away from us to find where they converge. Yeah. Uh, on a photo, it's, it's easy. You can also take a picture and do it on your phone, in your phone app, but, and mark, it, mark up a picture. So you'll notice though that um, I have, what's turning out to be two vanishing points. Yep. Um, and that's because the two sides are not parallel to each other. Exactly, yeah. So it kicks up a second vanishing point. Mm -hmm. Both those vanishing points are on my eye level line. Yeah. Is what I'm about to draw in with that straight edge. Right. So there's the eye level. Mm -hmm. So those, those are basically the steps that I teach people. I, I don't, I don't know anyone else who's come up with this. It's kind of something I made up in the process of writing and writing the book, uh, well, in teaching workshops and in writing Understanding Perspective. Um, so the first thing is the big shape. So that equilateral triangle on top is also one of the big shapes. Mm -hmm. The second thing is to extend the lines so you get uh, the to the vanishing point. And the third is to draw your eye level line in all the way across the page. There are lots of benefits to that, and um, but and I write about those in the books. Very so cool. now I'm going to show how I would start start that on a piece of paper. Mm -hmm. I generally start with one edge, a vertical edge, and it's often the left left side for some reason. I don't know why, but and you'll notice how I'm locating it on the paper. It's not in the middle. It's slightly to the right of center and it's lower than it is higher because I want to be able to have some sky and get those towers in without them, um, you know, going off the top of the page. This is the point where if I um, make, do something I don't really like, I will pick up my kneaded eraser and erase and start over. Like maybe I would need to draw that square lower on the page. Mm -hmm. I would um, erase it and just put it lower on the page. I haven't invested much time in my sketch, so it's super easy to make changes at this point. Yeah, and you're holding mm -hmm. your pencil very loosely. Yeah, and they're very light lines. I was worried they wouldn't show up at all. So, um, so I've got the big shapes, the vanishing points, and the eye level line. And once you put those three things in, you really have everything you need to complete your sketch. Uh, once you have those vanishing points in, you use them to, to draw your lines, and that's where the straight edge comes in handy. Um, or you can just practice making radiating lines on a big sheet of paper, and your hand will get better. Yeah. So, um, so there's the main shape in. Now I'm going to start adding some of the information on the side. In perspective, going to that vanishing point. 
get some of that roof in. So there's no detail at the beginning. It's just really blocking out the big shapes. Right. And now this is not a mechanical pencil. No, and that's a good good point. I didn't use a mechanical pencil because I knew it wouldn't show up oh. um, uh, on the screen. Um, I needed something with a slightly thicker, thick, thicker line um, in order for everyone to be able to see it. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I'm using just a regular pencil. But normally, if I were sketching in the field, you're right, I would have my 0.5 mechanical pencil with 2B lead in it. So you'll notice there's a horizontal line. If you go back and look at the look at the image, um, and it's about a third third of the way, uh, two thirds of the way up. So you see the little tick marks I made on that initial vertical I drew. I divided it just visually into thirds, and for the top third I drew that line, and that helps me accurately place the um, the round window. So now the fountain is going in, and that's a series of ellipses with the fountain in the center of the ellipse. And that just takes practice getting that in. Normally, I would try and draw the entire ellipse because it's much easier to draw the, the full shape of the ellipse instead of just a, a piece of the ellipse. Right. But um, So you can see all of the basics are starting to go in. Now I add a couple people for scale. Oh my gosh, I'm loving looking, watching you do the people. That's, that is really interesting. Most of the heads align with my eye level line. Even though I'm sitting, I kind of fudge that a little bit um, and draw them, most of the people in my, at my eye level line. So there is the final sketch that I did. I sat with my friend Marlene Dambrink. Oh, wow. Um, of the Den Haag Urban Sketchers. And we just laughed and had the best time. It's just, uh, it was just wonderful to be wow. able to um, sit with her and have this really relaxing, fun day on this bench and um, within this beautiful scene and get to do this sketch. So it's really one of my favorites. Wow. In part, because wow. I remember how much fun it was. Yeah. <laughs> and it came out in a way that I liked, which is, mm -hmm. doesn't happen most of the time. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, Stephanie, for sharing all those fantastic uh, sketches with us and your demo. Oh, thank you. That was, thank that you was much. fantastic. This is the other book. This is the first one. Yes. Which I think most people have. And to my amazement, I still see it in the bestseller list in its category on Amazon four years later. So this is the two of them. Yeah. Understanding perspective and then 101 sketching tips. This book came about because I um, didn't go to the symposium in Porto. Instead, I was teaching at a, a symposium in Taiwan called Asia Link, which is a fantastic symposium. I, I loved it, had the best time. Um, and so I thought for all the people going to Porto, I would do a series of blog posts. I do have a new blog. It's okay. uh, called drawingperspectives.com. Ha <laughs> ha. And um, uh, so I, I decided to do a series of blog posts uh, to kind of help people with their perspective uh, before the symposium. And um, I found myself waking up in the middle of the night, grabbing my phone and saying, oh, I could do a post about that. Oh, I could do a post about that. So after I did the 10 posts, I, the list just kept growing until I had like 150, 175 things that I, I wanted to write about. And so I contacted the editor and said, what do you think? Could this be another book? Yeah. <laughs> she said yes. Yeah. It, it turned into another book. Yeah. I didn't think I had another one in me, but there it was. Yeah, the 101 sketching tips. And mm -hmm. it's, it's fabulous. And you've called on a lot of other urban sketchers to help as well, right? Yeah, you know, I spent a lot of time combing the internet. I, I tried to find, especially for the second book, uh, people who you wouldn't have already seen in other books. So a lot of people that I met in Asia, for example, mm -hmm. uh, when I went to Asia Link. Um, so um, yeah, it was uh, it was fun putting it together. It's a it was like a serious herding of cats around the world. <laughs> <at all times. laughs> 
it was it was really challenging but so there are so many talented fantastic artists and sketchers out there it's 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 kind of overwhelming uh, you know i just and then when i'm around them i'm like when i'm sketching with suhita for example or mark holmes i i'm like oh i don't want to draw like that you kind of pick up their their energy yeah. and trying to emulate them and so um, I don't know. I just had to try and stay in my lane and, and do what I do. Yeah. What you do so well. Say, I just I see on my list here the Benildo, whom I met um, last year in uh, in Spain on the coast. Uh, we were sitting and teaching. A, I was sitting and teaching a workshop in, on the Costa Brava in Spain, and somebody comes up and he he puts his phone in my face. And it's my Instagram page. Oh. <laughs> and it was, querido Benildo, hola, mi amigo. <laughs> oh, wow. That's great. You have fans. Yeah, need to verte aquí. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, anyway. Um, uh, we want to uh, tell people about our upcoming workshop in Seville, right? That yes. Be, we, we hope, we hope, uh, May 1st to the 5th. And uh, we've got a beautiful workshop planned with uh, lots of gorgeous sketching locations. That look. You, you pronounce it way better than I do. The Giralda. Giralda. Yeah, my mother's okay. from Chile, so I get in trouble if I don't say it like I know some Spanish. Okay. <laughs> and El Cazar. El Cazar. And, um, and we have a bus trip to the nearby uh, hilltop village called Ronda. Um, yeah, and it's gorgeous. And um, now Game of Thrones was filmed there. Is that right? Yeah, some scenes from Game of Thrones in Sevilla. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we're hoping uh, that the, the coronavirus and uh, is going to let us go there. We'll see. Yeah. Hopefully, if we get a vaccine, the numbers get down, we'll be able to go there. It's going to be wonderful. Yeah, let's yeah. hope. So um, thanks so much, Stephanie, for chatting with me today. I really appreciate it. And I know that everyone on this call, I'm getting messages from people saying, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. This is a, a fabulous um, interview. And somebody said, I made two pages of notes. And I have to tell you the truth, I've been making some notes too. I always learn a lot from these interviews. So thank you so much, Stephanie. Oh my gosh, that's great. Oh, I'm look, going through and looking, I see my friend Bian Hall here in Seattle. I love you, Bian. <laughs> and uh, a lot of names I don't know. So it's nice to meet you all. And yeah. there's Bixie. This is so exciting. Oh my yeah. gosh, thank you everybody. So uh, people, um, this uh, interview has been recorded and hopefully if the recording is good, uh, it'll be posted on the Studio 56 YouTube channel. Uh, please like and share and subscribe. And um, as I said in my little commercial yesterday, if you just found out about this interview at the last moment, um, please subscribe to the Studio 56 newsletter because we announced it like a month ago. And we want to make sure that nobody misses out on this great opportunity to have time chatting with Stephanie and seeing her gorgeous art. Um, uh, Studio 56 also has online workshops with top artists like Ian Finelli and uh, Oliver Holler um, and Paul Keaston and me. So please uh, have a look at the Studio 56 website for those uh, online workshops. Thank you so much, Stephanie, and thank you everybody for tuning in. Stephanie, do you have any last words you'd like to share with people? Oh, just thank you all so much. You know, it's, um, it's, I think we have to just support each other as much as possible through all of this. This is so, so difficult on so many levels. And, uh, you know, I'm far more fortunate than many. So, um, but yeah, it's, it's really difficult. I have to say that the sketching community is, um, has been fantastic. I mean, I, I live for those, um, those chats, um, the USK chats, just a chance to see everybody around the world and, mm -hmm. and connect. So um, I hope everybody can hang tight and until we can um, travel and meet again. Yep, that's right. So thanks everyone for tuning in and I hope to see you so next much. time. And thank you so much, Stephanie. Thank you, Brenda. I appreciate oh. it. All right, bye everybody. Bye, everybody. Thank you.